Good evening, everybody, and welcome all of you to this live program at Orthopedic Principles. Today, our guest of honor is Dr. R.P. Jariwala from Scotland. Mr. Jariwala is currently working as consultant, shoulder, elbow, and trauma surgeon in NHS Desai, Dundee, Scotland. He completed his orthopedic residency in IMS BHU before completing his surgical training in Scotland. He gained further experience at the Writing Hospital in the United Kingdom. Mr. Jariwala has been extensively involved in teaching, training, and supervision of research projects for undergraduate, postgraduate, and the Master of Orthopedic Surgery, the MCH Orth Dundee students. He's published more than 40 papers in peer-reviewed journals. He's had numerous presentations, both nationally and internationally, as, and has won several research awards. Mr. Jariwala has been directly involved in supervision of MCH Orth Dundee students, orthopedic trainees, foundation doctors and medical students from the University of Dundee. For these contributions, he was recently promoted as honorary clinical reader with the University of Dundee. He also serves as the director in the University Department of Orthopedics and Trauma Surgery and also the director for the MCH Orthopedic course in Dundee, Scotland. So today, it's my great honor to introduce you to Dr. Arpi Jariwala from Scotland. Over to you, Dr. Jariwala. Uh, thank you very much, Itesh. I'll just... Uh... Is this coming out as a, a full screen? No, it, it has to be on full screen. You need to put it on full screen. Yeah? Yes, perfect. Good, okay. So have, hello everyone and hope, uh, thank you for all joining firstly and uh, on a Friday evening. Um, I know everybody is busy, but uh, thanks for joining. And first of all, uh, many thanks to uh, Professor, Professor Hitesh Gopalan who invited me for this uh, meeting. So big thank to you and also a big thanks to my friend Krishna Reddy who introduced uh, me to this uh, association. So uh, uh, hello ag again to everyone. Uh, so for someone who don't know where we are, we are in Scotland and I am, we are based in uh, Dundee, uh, which is a small, uh, which is a big in, uh, sort of educational town uh, um, about an hour away from Edinburgh. And this is where, this is my institute, which is a very huge hos um, teaching hospital where we have the Nine Wells Medical School, which is one of the best medical schools in the country, and also have a large uh, medical hospital, uh, uh, training and teaching hospital uh, with nearly thousand beds. And we also are now a major trauma center for East of Scotland. So very, very busy trauma as well. Now, other than one of, uh, other than that being one of our sort of highlights, the other thing that highlights Dundee is our MCH Orth course, which is uh, very famous, has been running for the last 27 years. Um, it takes the students through various uh, subspecialities of orthopedics like upper limb, hip and knee, foot and ankle, spine, soft tissue, pediatrics. And during the course, you get to exposure to anatomy, cadaveric sessions, to a shoulder and elbow, wrist, uh, so computer navigated uh, workshops, various symposiums. So. And if anybody's interested, um, I'll leave my email address with uh, Professor Kopalan and also at the end of the slide so you can have a look at it. So a lot about me and Dundee. So let's come to where we want to go today. And this today is um, next few slides we'll discuss the management of AC joint injuries. Now, very common injuries, but it's, it's, how, it's very strange that the management of it is so varied uh, and any... Uh, any country you go, any continent you go, you find that there are many people who have experience in different types of management of these and they would vouch that their treatment works well. So we'll go through some, what I do for my patients and what does the evidence tell us? Um, again, how do we get an AC joint uh, injury? It's mainly direct flow to the shoulder when, when pe people fall down and very common in jockeys and I see a few jockeys because around Dundee people ride and you see both their clavicles are um, dislocated um, and they need treatment. Also, you can have it when you fell down, fell down an outstretched hand. And now recently we are seeing more and more with high road traffic accident where the seat belt sort of holds the clavicle down and the AC joint is pulled apart. And these are quite significant injuries. So when you see a patient, if it's uh, you, uh, when I teach my trainees, I always tell them, make sure that that injury is just isolated because you don't want to miss something else that's going on, like a brachial plexus injury, along with an AC joint dislocation. So if it's a pure AC joint dislocation, there will be deformity, which is basically, uh, you'll see the prominence of the clavicle. And the reason why the uh, clavicle is prominent because the shoulder has drooped down. You may see also some bruising around it. Also check for neurovascular symptoms. 
And if you look at the anatomy of the a AC joint, uh, along with the AC joint ligament, which uh, lie along the AC joint where they are, the more stronger lig ligaments are more medial, which are the conoid and the trapezoid. And the way I remember it is conoid is a C and uh, C is closer to the center. So conoid lies more medially as compared to the trapezoid. Now, we all are aware of the um, uh, Rockwood classification. And again, I'll go through briefly with it. So the grade one where there's an AC joint sprain, the CC ligaments are intact. Grade two where the AC joint ligaments are ruptured and the CC ligaments are probably strained or stretched, but still intact. C third where the both AC and CC ligaments are ruptured and you see some deformity. Grade four is where both AC and CC are uh, ruptured and the clavicle is lying behind the um, uh, chromium. And grade five is where uh, the both AC and CC ligaments are ruptured, but the differentiation between grade three and grade five is the periosteal support or the supporting musculature and the fascia around the clavicle, which is your deltotrapezial fascia is also ruptured, which then makes that there is nothing holding the clavicle and your shoulder droops down and clavicle is much more prominent. And this is a much severe injury. And people say that some looks like the clavicle is hitting the ear. Grade six is very rare. It was only described by, Koro, uh, by Rockwood and it hasn't been seen since. So, but there are one or two reports of it. So uh, for discussion today, we'll rule it out. Um, um, uh, so we'll concentrate on one to five grades. Hitesh, uh, is my voice okay? Yes, perfect. <laughs> Thanks. So how what I've done is for convenience, I've grouped uh, grade one to three into one and grade four and five in uh, another group. So grade one to three, I mostly treat them uh, conservatively. So I designed the, uh, the AC, AC joint pro injury protocol in Tayside. And what it basically means is that if uh, the patients come to a &E or come to the orthopedic, orthopedic clinic and it's a grade one to three injury, where there is some deformity or not minimal deformity, some, uh, some bruising, then these are people are given a sling for a couple of weeks time, they get on to physio and they continue with physio for about eight to 10 weeks time. And if they're not still settling by about 10 weeks, they come back to see me. Um, and a majority of them would mainly have pain issues. And these are generally dealt with a, a local and steroid injection. Uh, you could give it under uh, ultrasound scan. Uh, I normally give it in the clinic because again, in NHS, the waiting time for an ultrasound scan would be humongous and patient will continue to have pain another four or five weeks. But if, if you have access to ultrasound scan, it probably increases the chances where you're going to put the uh, jo injection in the joint. And most of this will settle down. So in my experience, one to three, generally around 75% of them settle down with conservative management. Some may settle down in three to four weeks time. Some take a bit longer and a small proportion may take a local and steroid injection to settle down. However, be aware that one in four uh, patients will not settle down and will continue to have problems. And one, there'll be a subgroup where they have continued to have pain issues and, not, and the other group will have symptoms of uh, weakness. And it's very typical what these uh, patients tell you that the arm doesn't belong to them. Whenever they go to heavy task, the arm doesn't feel right. They find it difficult to do heavy task. And most of our um, patients are builders, laborers working on the um, uh, roads. So these patients will keep coming back. And then you have to then sort of look assess them and possibly they'll need surgery of some kind. Now, I would like to warn you that, and I'm, this is where some of my colleagues get caught, is that this is a patient who had a, which looked like an AC joint grade three injury, was discharged, continued to have pain, GP said just settle down, physio gave them an injection, didn't settle down, and then finally was sent to me. And I normally get, always get two views. And the reason I get two views is this, that the patients will have, um, that the, this is a grade four injury would look like a grade three injury and that's why he was having pain. So any patient that continues to have pain, a lot of pain with grade three injury, probably get a, 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 an axial view. This is an axial view. So this is your acromion here, uh, your glenoid here, uh, humeral head. And if you see the clavicle is, hit, uh, is locked behind the acromion. So get a, get a la axial view. I, that is my standard practice, so I don't normally miss grade fours. But if you don't, if you're only getting AP views, if the patients are not settling down, get an axial view. Make sure you're not dealing with a grade four injury because that likely will need surgical intervention. So tip of the uh, tip of the day one. 
So come to grade four injuries. And in my opinion, most of these will need surgery. I think um, more, more and more people need surgery. In my, in my practice, 75% of grade five, four and grade fives will need surgery. There are some, I would say 25% that settle down, but these are mostly people who don't do upper limb sort of heavy jobs or are, um, sort of um, uh, elderly ladies or elderly men who don't want surgery. But generally, if you have a grade four and grade five, they need surgery. And the reason being that it, the, the, there's much more ligamentous damage and it's a much more unstable configuration. So what do we do if we need to fix these? There are multiple um, uh, treatment modalities and which indicates indicate similar to something like a foot injury where there are foot surgery, where there are, there are 100 operations for bunion surgery. There are hundreds of operations for managing a AC joint uh, dis, uh, dislocation and which indicates that nobody knows what the right one is. Uh, but definitely putting a K wire or a boss fruit screw is out of the um, uh, box now. So I, I, wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't recommend this at all. And this possibly is uh, um, sort of heading towards negligence because these have a very high failure rate with Bosco, Bosco too. And also with the KOR, you're worried that it may trans, um, move, uh, move around and it, they don't address the uh, deformity. So other treatments that are common are, uh, one is a hook plate. And I think in India, a lot of people when um, uh, use hook plate and that's a decent uh, treatment modality. Um, the re my, my problem with hook plate is that one, um, it, uh, it, there, there needs to be a second surgery. So again, patients have to come in, get surgery done, and then another six to eight weeks of rehab. Secondly, the other problem is that I'm a shoulder surgeon, so I rarely get upset if somebody uh, starts to uh, fiddle with my lovely rotator cuff, and most of these patients will have some rotator cuff tendonitis, though majority of them, they'll settle down. So my issues is that, it, uh, that's why I've not used a hook plate for the last eight years. You, I used to do in my training, one of my uh, mentors used to teach me to do we were done. And this was basically you take the uh, coracoacromial ligament, which is quite a thick ligament when you actually go and expose it. You usually take it with a small piece of bone from the acromion and uh, you um, uh, take the, uh, uh, open the clavicle, take the la uh, lateral pendor, uh, clavicle away, make a small hole, put the uh, bone and the uh, CA ligament in, tighten it, and then put another loop around it. Generally used to work, but I used to see patients who just say, well, it's still still not right, it's still not right. So I thought probably we need to find something else. So when I started my consultant job about nine years ago, this is what was, was had started. And this is called a lockdown. This is a synthetic device. It is made of double bladed polyester. And it's the good thing about it is it's a reasonably quick operation. And once it's done, the, I, I normally mobilize them at two weeks time. I give them a sling for two to three weeks time. They're back to desk job driving around uh, six to eight weeks time and then back to contact sport as 12 weeks. So most of the patients uh, after when I see them back at six to eight weeks time, they're discharged um, and they do very, very well. And oh, this is what I've done for the last nearly eight years. And if you look at the evidence, this is not something I, I, I picked up on the back of my garage or in my um, study table. This is something that has been most used in UK. And I think this was a paper about four or five years ago. And they, by that time they had implanted 11,000. I recently checked last year, they have now inserted around 17,000 of these implants with good results. Um, and we, do, we have very few um, reports coming off of any major issues. So there's a big um, group of surgeons who is doing this. So how do I do this? Um, I normally do them um, in uh, as a deck chair position. So this is my setup. The patient is slightly more prone to that, uh, slightly more sitting up. I use a Tramano arm holder, which is a metallic um, uh, metal arm, which then helps me to position the arm once I'm tightening the uh, space up. Unfortunately, we don't have a hold of registrars as in India who can help. So we have to rely on metallic registrar. I do like the metallic uh, um, uh, hand because it doesn't tire, get tired, it doesn't uh, moan, and it doesn't have to go for uh, breaks. So incision, uh, it's a brass strap incision that I use because, um, and it's useful for me because then I can approach the coracoid easily and the back of the uh, clavicle as well. Uh, once I've made that incision, what I do is I need, normally uh, I do them at around um, two to three month mark. So by that time, AC joint is not looking healthy. So I excise it. Um, and that's what the recommendation of the technique is, because if you tighten it with the is, uh, complete uh, uh, clavicle intact, 
then these patients can come back with pain issues or uh, uh, crepitus. So I normally excise about five to seven millimeters of clavicle. And once I've excised it, then what there is a, um, a guide wire passer. So thereafter, you, what you need to do is once you have excised your uh, clavicle, then you expose your cor uh, corocoid and carefully make sure you're, you're developing a good plane between the corocoid and you're not taking any important structure lying immediately like the brachial plexus into your um, uh, hook. So you take this guide wire which passes through and then you hook it around the uh, clavicle, around the coracoid, sorry. And then what you do is with you pass the wire through um, and then you go around behind the clavicle, come over it and then help the arm up. So hold the arm up so that the AC joint is reduced. And the guide wire itself has a marking which will tell you what size to use. So once you've done that, you can take that size and uh, insert the ligament in. So I know I've gone fast with it, but uh, there is a small surgical video which I'd like to share with you so that you can exactly understand what I was trying to tell you. So this is the exact incision I use as well. I make a slightly longer incision. I don't believe in minimally invasive surgery. So once you made the incision, you raise the delta trapezial uh, flap, you take away the lateral end of clavicle, it's usually looking unhealthy. You clear the joint and then you expose your coracoid, make sure it's free of any adhesions. You're not taking any nerves or vessels, pass the hook and around it. And this is a guide wire that goes in, which also acts like a, a, a depth gauge. And then you pull that uh, hook away. And you secure the, the loop beneath the coracoid. And then you go under the uh, clavicle. And then this is where you reduce the arm. If you have an assistant, great. If not, the, the metallic arm holder is very helpful because it'll keep it there, it will not move. And then you measure the size. Once you measure the size, you take the hook off and you same hook, uh, same guide wire is used to um, thread the lockdown as well. So it's very useful that the, you don't need a lot of instruments for that. And you go back beneath the clavicle, same entry portal that you had made before. <clears throat> and then you reduce it on all that thereafter you do is put a 3.5 cortical screw with the washer in. and you cut the ribbing of the guide wire and that's your surgery done. So at the end, what you have is a well secured, well uh, reduced AC joint with the screw and the uh, CC ligament reconstructed with, a, uh, with the lockdown. So my post-op protocol, I normally leave them in a sling for a couple of weeks time. And thereafter, after two weeks, then I'm quite happy for him to start mobilizing. Um, and also they can start doing some um, computer work and four weeks time they can go start between four to six weeks time they can start moving light duties they can go back to desk job uh, driving um, and then by around a three month mark I, I would say they can go back doing everything they want including contact sports because many of these uh, are students who are rugby players or football players so they don't want to miss uh, in a lot of time uh, injury time. So they're quite happy and the shoulder feels very, very secure. So most of them, I think, go back earlier than three months. So again, when, we, when I started this after some years, we were having good results. So I wanted to audit and see what my results were because I know all my uh, shoulder, all my shoulder, elbow and wrist cases are audited so that I keep a track of how I'm doing in my own performance. So we looked at uh, uh, 20 patients out of which 18 were males and then two were females. 
three were excluded. The mean age was around 40 years, uh, ranging from 19 to 59. And most of them, the average operation time at that time was nine months, although some of them were done earlier within four weeks. Uh, and some were delayed because they did not want surgery and they wanted to con continue with conservative management. So a good spread of uh, sort of uh, acute and uh, delayed and chronic cases. The average uh, follow-up after the surgery was around six, seven months, and most of them were discharged with open appointments. So 15 of them were doing very, very well, and they were discharged with no issues. So I felt that was a good 90% success rate of what I was doing. Yes, like everyone else, if you operate, you get your, pro your complications and unhappy patients. So one of the patients underwent revision and what one got infected, and I'll discuss this at, uh, during my presentation. So when we look at evidence, um, that was my evidence, so nearly 90% of the patients were doing well. But if this is a paper coming out from uh, London, and they had a... Um, more patients than me at that time, 45 patients underwent review, 91% patients of, of patients were completely satisfied with the procedure and outcome, very few complications were encountered, and they had no infection. Unfortunately, I had one infection. So generally, this is a technique that is safe, well, um, patients are happy with it, and at least in my hands works very, very well. So some of my cases, this is a young lad who was, I think, 23, was playing rugby, injured his left AC joint, grade five injury, and he came in straight away. He wanted the surgery because his team um, uh, physio and the team doctor wanted him to be fixed so that he could go back to playing rugby. So we fixed in around six to eight week mark. We did very well, uh, discharged around three to four month mark, never came back. Uh, so I'm hoping he's done, doing well. Another patient, this was another. This was a patient who uh, sort of didn't want surgery initially. Um, he had some chronic pain issues, so he felt that this would um, further incite the pain. He waited for about 18 months. It became chronic, and he would still continue to be uh, uncomfortable. Had one or two injections in the AC joint to see if this was settled. It was a grade 5 injury. Didn't settle. Finally, he agreed for surgery, and we did the surgery, and he was very happy after that. So he, he did comment that he should have taken the um, done the surgery much before instead of waiting for nearly two years in, in agony. Another patient um, had a um, uh, injury. It was, this chap was a, he's a uh, hospital porter, but plays um, weekend football. So he had the AC joint injury, which I fixed um, with the lockdown. Uh, this was again done around four or five months down the line because he didn't want surgery initially, and then he wanted surgery. So he was fixed. He, uh, now, this is uh, his 13th week post-op. So not, normally I see them back around 10 week mark, 10 to 12 week mark. For some reason, his appointment was delayed. Probably I was away. And you see the brass strap incision is beautifully healed. Um, he had no problems. There is no obvious deformity. So uh, I, with his permission, I took some videos of him and I'll share it with him, with you. So this is him at 13 weeks post-op. That's his range of motion. He's a quite a big guy. So he has good range of full range of motion both sides. Uh, scapula is tracking well and has no pain. And this is some questions I asked him. So he's, he's a happy patient. And this is, my, I would say majority of my patients are like that by about 12, 13 weeks, they are fine. They're getting back to work, full work, enjoying their life. No issues with scar. No, uh, normally they leave the sling around two, three week mark. So you're not sitting for, the, for some sort of ligament to heal or a hook plate to be removed. Um, so normally as the, if, the, if I had done a hook plate on him, now we would be thinking of taking it out again. Again, loss of, uh, loss of earnings for these people. So I think for me, this works fine. Now, this is one of my happy patients, but I do want, I'm a surgeon, so I will have my fair share of complication and I don't hide them. 
So this was a patient who I did, uh, again, he had a um, AC joint dislocation, probably around six months post-surgery. He came to get me, uh, surgery by me, uh, did a lockdown to him, he did very well, dis uh, discharged around four month mark. And then I got a phone call around, he was about nine, eight to nine months post-op. And he had come in with a very sick swollen uh, area around the AC joint fluctuant. And one of my colleagues saw it and informed me. And I said, Arpit, it looks like infection. His, his pyrexial, his white, side, uh, white cell count was high. CRP was in hundreds. So I said, yeah, just it looks like infection. Just um, wash it out, take the ligament, take the metal work out, and just leave it and we'll see what happens. So he underwent surgery by my colleague. Everything was washed out. He said the ligament looked intact, but they had to take it away. Once they took the screw out, the ligament came out. He was washed. He was put on IV antibiotics for about four weeks and then oral for another two weeks as per the uh, local protocol. And I saw him back around three month mark after this, the revision surgery. And this is where he is. So his the deformity had mildly recurred, not hugely. And I, I asked him and he felt that the shoulder was not much changed despite the, the ligament was taken away. And I couldn't explain it. The only reason I can explain is that probably the scarring from the tissue from the surgery, two surgeries, and also from his infection probably stabilized the soft tissues around it. So he was happy. He didn't want anything. He said that the shoulder felt fine, except for occasional discomfort when he was doing too much. Um, he works as a laborer. So I left him. He's not come back. This is now four years ago. He's not come back for any further surgery or excision of the AC joint. Another interesting case. So this is a chap who is a heavy smoker, had some uh, has bronchitis, um, has major uh, other medical issues as well. And he has an, he was an AC joint uh, injury grade five, and he wasn't reluct he was reluctant for surgery. And so I was I because I, he wasn't a good surgical material, but he will continue to have problems. I injected him a couple of times to see if that would settle, but didn't settle. Then we went ahead and did the surgery. So again, lockdown was done. Everything went well. And he was very happy after the surgery, it disappeared for about a, a year. And then I got a phone call to see him back. So saw him back and actually what had happened is that he said the deformity had recurred. Suddenly one day he was lifting something in the garage and the, suddenly something snapped. So, and when I saw him, he, he was in more pain. Um, and uh, before that, before this episode, there was no pain. He was doing his work. Um, he works as an accountant. And he said the pain was probably nearly 75% of what he had after the first injury. So I got worried that I'd probably there was a uh, fracture at the screw point. So I got a CT scan. Uh, thankfully, there was no fracture of the coracoid or of the clavicle. So I was a bit bemused of what had happened. The only thing I would explain was that possibly the ligament had given way. So what we decided was that because he was not settling down, um, we left him for about three months to see if it would settle down, didn't settle down. So we took him back to theater. And in theater, it was interesting that what had happened is that the screw had gone through the ligament. Now, this is one of the areas we are a training hospital. So we get our trainees to do surgeries. Now, because I've done so many, um, I, I have supervised training, and this is a lapse on my part that I wasn't very careful where the trainee was uh, putting the screw in. So what is like it was the screw was going through the ligament. So part of the ligament had torn, and part of the ligament was still intact. So what what happened was the constant movement. The with the screw acted like a little knife and cut through the ligament. So all we did was to take all the metal work away, clean it up, and what I did was a re revision lockdown uh, with a slightly more medial, and I put the screw more medially. And again, this is where it is. On the right-hand side, you can see the previous uh, screw hole and the new screw hole. And he was, again, he, he's recovered very well and he's been discharged. That's another 18, 19, 20, 18 to 20 months since I discharged him. We have not seen him back. So complications do happen. Infection can happen. Uh, are you putting an implant in? Again, there can be complications, but the, again, there are plan Bs for these. So... Um, <clears throat> Now, coming to newer technique, I know um, uh, that people are now using um, uh, different techniques, um, uh, dog bone and uh, other issues that they can use, some people doing arthroscopically. But, and I started to look into it, but if you look at the evidence, um, the evidence shows that, that lockdown is doubly uh, stronger than any of the um, uh, other um, techniques that are available. Now, I know of a colleague who does tight ropes, but he uses two tight ropes in a single uh, uh, AC joint dislocation. Now, one, one he had a coracoid fracture because the tight ropes were very close. Secondly, the cost is heavy, more than lockdown, and he feels that one is not enough. So, 
the cost of a tightrope is nearly the same as lockdown. So why I personally don't have not yet been convinced to use a tightrope or anything other than lockdown, especially because my patients are quite happy with it. Uh, if you look at the uh, current management of what um, surgeons in UK use, so um, the surgeons that are less than 10 years, that would include me, they normally still the lockdown is the favored implant. There are other like a large ligament or tightrope or um, dog bone being used. The other treatment modality like we were done, AC joint uh, resection or hook plate, possible screws, these are coming down in, in percentage, but log lockdown seems to be still the predominant shareholder of the market. And that's not because the company is selling it hard, but because we are happy with its results. So with that little note, thank you very much. I'll leave that slide on. That's my email address for the university. So if anybody was interested in any follow-up questions or uh, interested in doing the MCH or any of our courses, uh, please write to me directly. And many thanks to you, Dr. Gop uh, Gopalan, for the invitation. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Jariwala, for that fantastic presentation. A uh, couple of questions from our side. Is there a risk for a coracoid fracture uh, with the lockdown technique? Have you had any? So I've not had any. And I've, I've, uh, interestingly, I was uh, teaching the trainees about two months ago. So I went back and looked at the literature. There haven't been any coracoid fractures uh, uh, described from it. And I, I believe if you have a coracoid fracture, people will describe. And again, I work very, uh, sort of the rep is usually there sometimes in the meetings and things like that. So I've not heard a coracoid fracture, but yes, there is always a possibility uh, if you make it too tight. So there is a balance of what you want to achieve with it. So if you, if you make it too tight, the one worry is that they, they, the clavicle may fracture or you may have a fracture of the coracoid, but I've not seen it. No, in my practice, I've put about 60, 70 of these in the last eight, nine years. I've not seen one. Uh, thank you, Dr. Jariwala. That's a huge number of cases you have done. And have you noticed that the uh, any resting uh, change in the resting position of the clavicle? For example, you put a loop like that. Does it shift anteriorly? Is there a tendency to shift anteriorly or something like that? So you do find that some of these, if they are quite a significant injury, so even grade five, some of them are quite stable. Once you reduce them, they just stay in that place. But some of them you'll find that there is a lot, they, they translate anteriorly or posteriorly, it pulls, pulls it slightly anterior because you're pulling towards the coracoid. So what, but that, what, that's the point where when you, you have that play with this technique where you can slightly ease off, get it back slightly back so that the tension is not too weak, but also you're not pulling it too anteriorly and then put that screw in that place. And that's where it's very useful that I use that guide wire to see where I will be. So I use it like a, a lockdown. So once I'm reducing it, if the clavicle starts to drift in front, I'll take a slightly bigger lockdown um, instrument so that it's not too tight and make sure that position is there. And also do we need to repair the AC joint uh, capsule as well, isn't it? So to prevent this translation. So what I'll do is because I create a whole delta trapezial fascia, I normally go and suture the delta trapezial fascia with the AC joint in that gap. Although there is a gap in between, but there is flexibility in it. But I don't do specific anything because I've seen, um, um, I was in a presentation few, uh, probably last year, where they were do, passing the the, uh, the tendon through the clavicle and then taking it through into the acromion and coming back. Uh, now I've seen one of them coming back to me, uh, which was done in Switzerland, and he, I don't think he had the same range of motion as the lockdowns I have. So there were successful lockdowns. You saw the range of motion. It was nearly complete. There was no difference between right and left. So I normally don't get involved putting anything across the AC joint, although I repair the capsule, yes. Thank you, Dr. Jariwala. And what is the difference between the lockdown and the last ligament? Both are synthetic. Is it polyester? What is the, what is the material? So it is poly, uh, polyester. The difference is that the, the last ligament, you have to tie it and then you suture it on itself. This has a screw in it. So it has much more controlled. And also I think you, you can, uh, I find it that once you get the purchase in the screw, it becomes very, very well secured. Thank you. Just one last question before we wind up the session. Is there a risk for an immunological reaction? Because this is a synthetic ligament and you're putting in the shoulder. Is there a risk described? Good question. And um, they, um, I think the, the person who, who sort of invented it, Professor Angus Wallace, some of you who have worked in UK might know. So he, he looked at some of these that he had taken. So he had done a huge many, uh, 
he had done a huge number and also what he did was any failed ligament he would can get it transported to him to get it analyzed in the laboratory so we look, there's a paper out there we looked at it most of the tendon gets uh, sort of gets um, the ligament gets sort of imbibed in the soft tissue structure um, we there is no as such st uh, stories about uh, immunological reaction to this we also looked at if it is possible that you may get a latex type reaction but that is not seen now whether the infection that i had was a re immunological reaction and then it developed into a, a small hematoma and then had an infection we don't know but we are not seeing that and you would see that there are 17000 been put in so if it was an immunological reaction was an issue people would be coming out because there are options available now so lars is there there is the 10 people use 10 um, the uh, hamstrings graft uh, the people also use hook plate people use now using uh, the tight ropes so there are it's not that there's no option we just have to use this so there are many there are options available so if there were a lot of infections lot of um, coracoid fractures clavicle fractures uh, revision surgery people would be writing and moving on to something different but that's you saw the 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 table of the people who are using it lockdown seems to be still the double of the market Thank you, Dr. Jerry. Well, I think that's all the questions that we have for this session. Thank you for a fantastic lecture from your side. And I'm sure this lecture is going to benefit a lot of people all over the world. Good. Thank you so much for your in in invitation and uh, thanks to all of you who attended. Thank you very much.